So floor is yours. Uh, we're gonna take, I'm gonna gather some questions in Q&A or chat, please write them down. And at when the time is uh, more or less right, switching between slides and so on and so forth, I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, ask Helen. And then towards the end, once we have the most of the the this the, of the presentation completed, um, uh, you know we can uh, get people to turn on their mics and, and camera and then ask directly more complex questions and stuff like this. And then once we completed our sixty minutes of recorded talk, the the remaining time will be unrecorded and we have less formal uh, discussion. Uh, Helen, the screen is yours. The screen is yours. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, for this very nice introduction, and I'm, I'm delighted to be uh, to be with you uh, today. And of course, a very uh, specially uh, warm uh, welcome if there are any Ukrainian colleagues or base, colleagues based in Ukraine. Um, so it's um, it's really a pleasure to discuss this uh, this paper. It's the result of uh, joint work with a number of uh, of co-authors. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to condense the idea here of um, of two papers and spend a bit more time on uh, is this time different financial follies across centuries. Um, but um, so what I'm going to say reflects the joint work with Jeremy Fulia, Michael Howell, and Vanya Stavrakeva. Uh, as we um, just uh, recalled in the introduction, um, we, there are very big events uh, in the macroeconomy. Uh, obviously, some are wars, some are financial crises. And uh, the financial crises um, have been with us for a, a very long time. We have a lot of examples of financial crises across uh, history and across um, countries. And each time we, uh, we face one, uh, they, are, uh, they tend to have very large costs. So not only economic cost, of course, but also social cost and uh, political cost. Uh, we have this uh, large database uh, at the IMF done by Luc Leven and, um, and Valencia, documenting that on average, um, the cumulative output loss for a banking crisis, for example, is about 20% uh, uh, of GDP over the length of a crisis. So we, we are talking about extremely large uh, macroeconomic disruptions. Here I have a quote from Keynes who talks about an economic catastrophe. And uh, what I found very interesting is that already it was written, obviously, after the 1929 um, uh, financial crisis. He reflects on how uh, we have blundered in the control of a delicate machine, the working of which we do not understand. And the result is that our possibilities of wealth may run to waste for a time, perhaps for a long time. So this was um, you know, already a reflection about the difficulty of um, understanding the mechanisms between these very large uh, financial crises. And if we uh, fast forward to 2008, so this is here, the fall of 2008. This is at the time of uh, Lehman Brothers uh, crisis. So the queen uh, was visiting the London School of Economics. And uh, at that point, uh, she was shown a lot of graphs, but you can see some of that on, on, on the right here, um, with uh, massive financial imbalances and uh, essentially how the financial system had melted down. And uh, she asked the faculty, the economic faculty, OK, so how come nobody noticed it? Right, if there were all these financial imbalances. And so here you can see um, it's, uh, it's the photo was taken from the Twitter of, of Luis Garicano, who is in the middle here, <laughs> and uh, discussing with, uh, with the Queen about these issues. And uh, on the spot, um, according to most accounts, so the answers were not uh, super um, well substantiated. So after uh, several months, the British Academy and the economic section of the British Academy wrote a three page answer to the Queen. And in that, uh, in that letter, uh, towards the end, they say, well, essentially, the lack of foresight of a crisis can be blamed on principally a failure of a collective imagination of many bright people, both in this country and internationally, to understand the risks to the system as a whole. So it's the same theme as the Keynes uh, comment. It's basically, it's a very a complex system and we don't understand uh, very much how it works. Um, so we lack imagination. In fact, Luis told me he did give an answer to the Queen at the time. He said at every stage, someone was relying on somebody else and everyone thought they were doing the right thing. So again, the lack of kind of putting things together uh, in order to, uh, uh, to uh, avoid crisis. So in, uh, in these two papers, um, 
that I've been working on with my co-authors, we are trying to, to give a more systematic answer. Uh, and uh, we, we are trying to predict systemic crisis, so the big uh, systemic crisis such as 1929, such as uh, 2008, and other uh, which are more country specific, but which are also systemic in nature, uh, well in advance. And by well in advance, I'm going to mean here three years ahead. Uh, and in order to do that, we are going to use uh, some uh, machine learning tools that have not been used much in economics at all. Uh, and the reason we are, so I will, I will describe what are those tools and why we think they are particularly appropriate to predict these big events such as financial crisis. But the reason we want to predict systemic crisis three years ahead or two years ahead, say, but well in advance, is because if we are trying to um, avoid those crises by doing macro prudential policies, which now we, uh, we have some uh, policy tools, uh, some macro prudential authorities because of Basel III, uh, then you need time because you need time to, uh, for example, if you want to put an additional countercyclical buffer uh, for the banking system, uh, you, the banks, once a macro financial authority decides that, which takes a while, a few months usually, to, to, to come to a diagnosis and to, and to, decide, uh, to side, decide what to do, the banking system still has like one year in order to build up the capital buffer. So we need a lot of lead time Otherwise, uh, policy does, does not have the time to act, essentially. By the way, I'm on the French macroprudential authority, but uh, I, uh, this is totally uh, not the view of the French macroprudential authority. This is only my view, what I'm describing in this paper. OK, uh, so now uh, it is the case that we have um, very rich literature on early warning indicators of financial crisis. So there are some classic papers in there. Uh, using usually relatively uh, simple econometrics. Um, and uh, I've listed a few very uh, kind of famous papers. There has been a revival due to the 2008 crisis uh, with in particular using historical data. So I've put here a few recent, uh, recent papers. There's a nice survey by Sufian Taylor in the new handbook of international economics, which has the whole uh, literature. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very nice overview. In terms of... Um, machine learning, uh, so use of machine learning to, to forecast crisis, we start to see a few things. Uh, it's mostly people using some type of machine learning model. It could be, uh, I don't know, neural network, or it could be a, a random forest or something like that. This is very different to what uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, my uh, methodology uh, today is going to be based on model aggregation. So that's really about aggregating uh, different models of crisis. Now, why is it an appropriate way of doing things? Uh, I think it's because if we think about the theories of financial crisis, we have uh, lots of them. Uh, so starting with uh, some writings by Keynes, Irving Fisher, but also, um, of course, the famous book of Reinhardt and Rogoff, Kindleberger, Minsky, et cetera. And all these uh, different theories, we emphasize different channels. Some describe bubbles, moral hazard, leverage, search for yield, some behavioral explanation, overconfidence. So there is a lot of uh, the role for household debt, from balance of payment crisis, capital flows, uh, real exchange rate, overappreciation, et cetera. And it's very likely that all these mechanisms uh, are relevant, one way or the other, for some countries during some period of time. So the issue is really, again, how to look at the, at the system of uh, of forces which may interact in a very nonlinear way uh, in a kind of an encompassing uh, framework. So we need a methodology that allows that, that allows for many different variables, different models, different channels, nonlinear interactions, uh, effects that may be time varying. Uh, and at the same time, it, it does seem that, you know, uh, and, and this is something uh, I will show that, uh, that we are able to predict those crises. So there's, there must be some information somewhere. So it's just a matter of, uh, of finding it. So the methodology we are, we are using is called online learning in the machine learning literature. And it's not about um, having a lot of data, of fancy data and trying to, uh, to see whether we can find a correlation somewhere. It's not that at all. It's about aggregating optimally different models of financial crisis. So why, why is it, uh, I think, the right way to, to think about this issue? It's because, A, we have some models of crisis, but we have many of them. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to try to, to see which ones uh, 
at some point in time may be uh, important. Uh, it's a methodology that doesn't make any assumption on the data generating process, so we don't know what it is. It not, does not need to be stationary or anything like that. Uh, it will allow for time varying weights in the, in the model aggregation, and that's important because, uh, especially if we look at long historical data, but not only, we might have uh, breaks in, uh, in the time series, in, uh, in the causes of financial crisis. And this is a methodology that uh, does out of sample forecast and has been uh, designed uh, to deal with overfitting, uh, which is traditionally a problem in the literature. If you try to forecast something and you do in sample regressions, then you end up uh, very often overfitting. And finally, I think uh, it's not a black box methodology in the sense that we won't be able to show causality, but I think we will learn something from the type of models that are picked at some point in time for some countries. Okay, so it's going to be, uh, I would say, suggestive and, and certainly will give some kind of narrative about the, about the crisis. So we are not creating the models and the methodology ourselves. We are uh, using it, uh, it's statisticians who have developed this, uh, this framework. It has been used uh, outside uh, of economics mostly, so in particular to predict French electricity consumption or for climate models or for network traffic. So here is how we, this works, and given the, you know, uh, how much time we have, I won't go into a lot of detail on the methodology, but I want, just want to give you the, the flavor of how things work. It's a, it's a framework which does sequential predictions. So in our case, we are uh, first of all receiving a question. So what is the question? Is there going to be a crisis uh, three years from now is the question, okay? And in order to answer this question, we are going to use uh, what is called in that literature expert advice. This can be econometric models, could be um, you know logit models or probit models or whatever, um, or it could be it could be anything. It could be a machine learning model. It could be a random forest model, or it could be uh, the view your views, the view of someone, the view of a of a human expert. If you give me your time series of prediction, <laughs> I can put it in my, uh, in my set of experts. Okay, so it can be anything. Using this, um, this expert advice, we are going to make a prediction, which is whitey hat. And then we will know with a delay because uh, we are predicting crisis three years from now. So we will know only if we are right or wrong uh, with a delay of, uh, of three years. We will, we will get the true answer. And depending on our answer, we will suffer a loss depending on how far we are from the truth. And then we, we will move forward by uh, one period and we will, we will keep going, um, making this out of sample forecast. So that's the sequential predict prediction framework. And so the big question is how do we aggregate those models? How, how does the methodology work? Uh, Helen, so, I have a, if, yeah. if I may, I have a very quick question. Sure. For example, if the answer comes from a model, uh, the model already minimizes some sort of loss function to, pre to produce the first prediction. Mm -hmm. Um, is so is this sequential? I mean, it's basically a convolution of loss functions that that is happening here, or how does it work? No. So you're going to see we are going to aggregate. So you you will get uh, prediction from some models, okay? Yeah. And um, these models will have a certain weight in my uh, in my aggregation rule, and so out of these um, model predictions and the weights, I will get my whitey hat. And this is this whitey hat that uh, will enter the loss function of the forecaster. And depending how far away this whitey hat is from the true whitey, the observed whitey, I will incur a loss. Yeah, yeah. I'm they, going to they, be minimizing that loss, not the, you know, that, that, yeah. that loss that I'm going to be minimizing. Understood. So, for example, this is good because you can include all sorts of answers, which is uh, human answer, machine answer. But, for example, if it's a model, that mm -hmm. makes a prediction to get the weight before before we go that there that model will be minimizing some sort of loss function to create the first prediction mm -hmm. isn't it like that yeah, yeah. sure so on, we okay. are going to be estimating okay. these models on a batch sample you will see that and then we will be optimally aggregate them so we will okay. be picking optimal weights absolutely okay. mm -hmm. Good. colin has a question yeah there's a <laughs> Yeah, just the, the, the Lucas critique question. Um, so you mentioned getting the YT three years later, um, mm -hmm. it, but if policy has changed, then how are you dealing with that? So uh, the good thing is that on the whole historical period that I, that I have, 
uh, I can say that policy has not worked or has not been done because there was no macroprudential policy. <laughs> and um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have been very bad at forecasting crisis. So we have not been doing uh, much at all. So, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Do I manage to predict my crisis or not? And you will see that I, I do. <laughs> so that means that certainly uh, whoever was in charge of policy was not following my model <laughs> or didn't do anything. Okay. <laughs> but otherwise, obviously, a uh, Lucas critique always applies, right? I mean, so. Okay. Uh, so here is my whitey hat, and this is um, a combination of my expert FJTs, so FJ, uh, with the weights which are denoted by the PJ. So here I have, for example, uh, N experts, and I, I'm going to use them to form the whitey hat. Then uh, my forecaster's loss function is a cumulative loss function, which is of the following form. So from t equals one to t, so it's uh, it's cumulative, or I, I take care of, uh, or I look at all the period. It's um, given here, we can use different ones, but I'm gonna use a very simple one, that's a quadratic loss function, which is simply therefore a kind of Euclidean distance between uh, whitey hat, my forecast, and the truth. The question is then, what? how does this methodology exactly work? How do we measure the performance of this uh, aggregation rule given by the time varying P's, PIs. Well, we do not have any idea or uh, really any um, assumption on what generates uh, the process of the financial crisis, the data generating process. So the way we are gonna be um, judging the performance of aggregation rule is in a relative term. We define a very important object here called the regret. And so the regret is the cumulative difference between the loss function of the forecaster, me, and the loss function of one of the experts. Okay, so loss of FJT, YT, that's gonna be the, again, the Euclidean distance between the expert and the, and the truth. And the regret is the difference between these two loss function. So you can think of a regret, it's called a regret because it measures how much the forecaster regrets not having followed the advice of a particular expert or a particular combination of experts. To make things maybe clearer, what we are gonna do is to minimize the regret with respect to the best combination of experts. So that's gonna be that, that object here, that's the best combination of experts. And this is the loss function of a forecaster. And we are gonna try to minimize the regret between the loss function of a forecaster and the best possible combination of experts, which is something we will know ex post which one we have the best ex experts to predict uh, the crisis, we will know that ex post, but ex ante, we're gonna try to be the closest as possible to the loss function of these best possible combinations of experts. So that means that um, effectively, uh, this is a very uh, metastatistical, appro metastatistical approach in the sense that uh, we are gonna be able to make a good prediction if two things are true. The first one is if in our set of experts, we have good experts, so experts which will turn out to be quite okay at predicting financial crisis. If we put garbage experts who have nothing to say about financial crisis, we won't be able to make good predictions. That's clear, okay? So garbage in, garbage out, that's absolutely true. So we need reasonable experts. And then we need to be able to approximate them, to approximate ex ante, uh, the best possible combination of these experts. So that's, that means we have two types of errors that we are trying to, to minimize here in our, in our approach. The one is, uh, uh, one is the regret, which is really how difficult it is to approach ex ante the best possible combination of experts. And the second one is the approximation error of the best possible combination of experts themselves. So that's what we are trying to do. And uh, there are nice statistical results uh, which in very general um, settings show that the, this regret is bounded. So there's a bound which depends on, on T and which depends on the log of a number of experts. So this is a nice property because the log of N doesn't increase as much as N. And therefore um, there are some uh, 
some nice convergence property, which are asymptotic uh, convergence property. And we are going to select aggregation rules with what is called the vanishing per round regret, which means that the regret goes to zero asymptotically. And those aggregation rules, there are several of them, but I'm just going to present one to give you again some intuition, uh, which is quite robust in our case, um, actually, to predict credits. That's a simple one called the exponentially weighted average aggregation rule, EWA. So it's a convex aggregation rule. We see that we, we pick the, the weights in a convex set, some equals to one, and they are all positive. And how are they computed? They are computed with this formula. It looks ugly, but it's not, <laughs> not really ugly. Um, you see that exponential, that's why it's called exponentially weighted uh, average, okay? And uh, aggregation. And then here what we have are, um, uh, we, we, uh, we have the gradients of the loss function. So uh, what this rule is telling you is that if you have in the past some experts that have really pointed you in the wrong direction, you are going to downweight that, that experts. So the weight of that expert is going to go down. And how quickly are you going to do it? Well, it depends on this learning rate, which is uh, time varying. So, uh, and that's going to be also maximized upon from a, so there you can do it either theoretically or empirically. And we are going to use it for that uh, in, in the application here empirically. Uh, but so that can, uh, that can be uh, downgrading your experts quicker or, or, or not. Uh, and which one's downgraded depends on the, on the gradient here. Now you notice that um, because uh, of, uh, of this uh, model aggregation uh, technology, in a way, uh, if you have one supermodel, so if you're super confident that you can actually predict financial crisis or something super well, well, we can throw your model in our set and the weights will go towards one. If it's really a very good model, it will, it will take all the, all the weights. So we are kind of guaranteed uh, at least asymptotically, and you will see empirically it works as well in, in sample at, as well, to do at least as well as the best forecaster, forecasting model out there. Okay, and if you can find a better one, we throw it in. So <laughs> we can always Im improve. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna show you can, quickly. Yeah. Can I ask you very quickly? So. Um, if we were to take like a one line of how the of how the algorithm and how regret works, mm -hmm. we first find a set of vectors p, which are time varying, that give us the weights to the best combination of models, and then regret allows the final user to adjust his own or her own p's over time to the ones that uh, are observed in the model, uh, are observed in the first loss function uh, y, y hat y? No, uh, what you are, uh, you are doing is that you are first, um, and I will, I will show you it on the, on the sample, let me that will be easier. You are okay. first, you, you, you take the beginning of your sample, you, up, you estimate of your models, and then you start with uh, say uniform weights. Okay. And then you do out of sample forecast, you compute your loss function, uh, you minimize, the regret, and uh, that's going to lead you to update your set of weights. Ah, okay, and understood. Be updated over okay. each time. Understood. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, so I, I will I will actually show you exactly the how how the data uh, looks like. Uh, so I'm going to do two things. One is very quickly I'm going to show you results on a database that goes from. Um, uh, 85 till uh, 2019 Q3. So this is a kind of macroprudential uh, database that would be used by, uh, by central banks, in, especially in the euro area. And I'm gonna use here only of the shelf um, datation of crisis. So that's gonna be the official ECB database of systemic crisis episodes, which has been built using uh, the judgment of national authorities and the peer review. So they define very precisely what a systemic crisis is, uh, and uh, and and they, uh, they they use the input of the national central banks to harmonize everything and and to, to build uh, to build that data. Uh, and I'm going to um, to pick a number of countries. So here, big countries of the area plus uh, the UK and the US. 
and Sweden in order to have a bit of variety. I could pick many more countries. It's just a matter of doing the things, right? So it's not uh, what you do need in order to do the prediction for a country, though, is that at the beginning of your sample, or sometimes <laughs> you observe, but, but preferably at the beginning of a sample, you observe a systemic crisis because it has the algorithm has to learn somehow. So if you don't have a systemic crisis, uh, you cannot learn. So that's the only thing that you that you need. What we are going to uh, try to predict is a pre-crisis indicator. Uh, here it's um, so it's uh, int, which is equal to one if there exists um, a, a time h uh, between one and twelve because we're in quarters such that we have a crisis uh, at t plus h. So that's what I'm trying to predict, and zero otherwise. So that's a pre-crisis, and I'm not trying to predict the crisis, but really the 12 quarters before. What kind of variables am I going to use for my models? I'm going to use a standard variables that um, you know anybody would use in macro finance. So there is going to be macroeconomic variables, credit and debt indicators, banking sector, interest rate, real estate, markets, uh, external conditions, liquidity. So this is totally standard. So that's no, no innovation there. And what kind of models am I going to use? So again, there, one natural way to start was to use uh, the models that the central bankers have been using. So we take some of those uh, central bank models from various national central banks. Uh, some, some people estimated probit models, dot logit, other, other ones logit, other ones uh, Bayesian models. So we reproduce what they do. Okay. And then we also throw in some uh, statistics models, such as uh, GAM model, some um, machine learning model, random forest, uh, SVM models. And then um, we also throw in a lot of uh, logit with elastic net penalty because these are models that statisticians have found are good at our sample forecast. So in particular, you have a statistical school in Stanford, which studies a lot of the properties of uh, this logit with elastic net penalty um, in order to, um, uh, to, to do out of sample forecast. So the only thing that we do is that we group them by themes. So we build some logit uh, with uh, real economy variables, other with valuation variables, with foreign, with banking variables, credit variables. We do a logit BIS, which is uh, the type of variables that the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, likes. It's a mixture of, um, of credit and, uh, and also uh, debt sustainability ratios for households. Uh, so so we, we do all that. And then we also have some, uh, some logit which, whose variables are selected based on um, a NOROC criteria at the beginning of a sample. So we test which model seems to have the more uh, predictive power in the batch sample at the beginning of a sample. We take those variables and uh, we construct logit with those variables. So we have some experts like that. So there's no magical number about um, about um, the number of, uh, of models or which models to put. And so you are very welcome to throw in <laughs> whatever you want to throw in. So let's have a look at, at, at uh, what we get now. So I'm first gonna show you the results for France. So here is the sample for France here. We, uh, we start um, here around 1985. Uh, we have different colors which corresponds to uh, crisis periods. Systemic crisis in France are the light blue bars. We had one uh, in the 1990s and one in uh, around 2008, 2009. That's not what we want to predict. What we want to predict are the, the bars immediately before. So these are the kind of uh, pink, uh, orange, I don't know how you see them, but pink, pink bars here, which are just before the blue bars. We want to predict this. So we want essentially to have one here and uh, zero uh, everywhere, everywhere else. That's what we would want to do. Now, uh, it turns out that in France, not only we had systemic crisis, but we also had what has been called in the ECB database, uh, smaller crisis, residual events. And the residual events, uh, you have, um, they are called non-systemic crisis. You have a purple bar here, which are um, smaller crisis, considered non-systemic, but financial stress period, nevertheless. And the pre-crisis period of that of these uh, residual events are the green bar. But 
we don't want to predict them. We just want to predict systemic crises. Okay, so from the point of view of our algorithm, if we go up during those periods, it's interesting, but it's it's it will be a mistake. The batch sample is all the beginning of a sample. It will include here a systemic crisis period and a pre-systemic crisis period. So we can we can learn on that, and then we will go out of sample. Okay, so the batch is going to be uh, here between eighty five and. Uh, 2000 something, and then we will get, we will go out of sample. So here is what we get with our EWA uh, aggregation rule. You can see that here we start 2000, uh, between 2001 and 2002 out of sample. So this is all out of sample prediction. You see that our probability of crisis goes up more or less at the right time and is very uh, it's a very severe signal it's a very informative signal it goes up to one then it comes down as it should during the crisis period because we predict pre-crisis and after that we do have a, a kind of increase in the signal again this is the residual event from the point of view of our loss function it's a mistake right and then it goes back to zero so for france here we have a very good um prediction a very powerful signal out of sample of the pre-crisis period. So I think what, what, we, uh, what we do in the paper is that we do show explicitly the probability, the time series of the probability of crisis. And, and we think it's good to do that as opposed to only reporting, for example, uh, OROC or root mean square errors. Because we, if you are on a macroprudential authority, you want, you want to have a clear signal. You could have a very high OROC, so very uh, seemingly good statistics to predict crisis, even if you had a tiny increase in the probability of crisis, provided it would be roughly at the, at the right time. Okay, That would give you a, a very good OROC, possibly, if you had a probability going up here. But, but would that really bother the macroprudential authority? It's not so clear. Whereas here, you can see that it's, it's, it's certainly giving a lot of, of signal. So nevertheless, we, uh, we compute the OROC, I will show you, and, and the root mean square error to compare with the literature. Now, the interesting thing also is to see, well, which are the models that give you those, uh, those predictions. So we look at the, the weights of the different models. Here, they don't move at the beginning because we have this three-year delay before we know if there was a crisis or not. So we, don't, we, we update the weights with a delay of, four, four, of 12 quarters. Okay, so that's why here we have stable weights. Then the weight starts to move. And you see that here, the, we seem to be converging to some of the models, which seems to be uh, doing a good job. Now, maybe even more interesting is out of these models which have weights, which ones are, are giving the signal? Okay, and so we look at, in the case of France, which models are giving the increase in probability here. And the increase in probability is given mainly by this LC4 uh, here model. So what is LC4? That's it. So that's a model that is uh, that's a logit elastic net, which has variables reflecting real estate, also reflecting credit, so volume variables. And uh, so price to income is also a, a real estate variable. Credit, as you can see, it's both to households and to a non-financial corporation. And also it has variable reflecting uh, valuations. Okay, so it's, it's a kind of a mixture of, of, uh, of variables. And from the point of view of France, uh, it, it is indeed something that, you know, in terms of soft knowledge, <laughs> uh, we know that especially the, the real estate stuff has been, uh, and the price to income, uh, has, 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 become, has been an important kind of uh, type of variable. So, so that's what we find for, for France. And maybe interestingly about the methodology itself, what we plot here is the average loss suffered by all our experts. And you see uh, our uh, EWA aggregation rule has a very, has the lowest loss. So it's doing better than any of our experts. Though the LC4 expert is doing pretty well. We also have a BMA model that, that does pretty well, a Bayesian uh, models. And, and, and you see that if we were to just average our experts, do a uniform aggregation, we would do worse. That would be a, a uniform aggregation of a model. 
the loss is way higher than with our EWA expert. So that means that really our aggregation rule is doing something for us here. The cumulative square loss of all these experts, it's another way of looking at it, is here. You see that the EWA rule has the lowest cumulative square loss, then we have LC4, and then we have all our experts. You see that some of them get it very wrong <laughs> over time, right? So, so that's, uh, that just shows that EWA again is, is doing something for us. Yes, Colin, there's a question. Yes, Ellen, I've forgotten. Can you short experts? Do the, do the P's have to be no. non-negative? Yeah, in this really? EWA, they are convex. So uh, they, are, they, are all, they are all positive and they add up to one. But you have other aggregation rules that you can use, uh, one called okay. the ridge aggregation rule, in which uh, you can have negative uh, weights. Because um, that would be fun. I mean, to see but, to see which people are just adding noise to the process. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. guess it'd be worse than noise. I mean, it would be okay. Let's see. So it's it's feasible. I mean, there are statistical results for convergence also on these things. Okay, so just to show, we we also do two years ahead. Whatever, it's a different model. So it's kind of interesting is that three years ahead we do have a, some stuff about credit and volume, etc. And when you go two years ahead, you go more towards the valuation stuff and the prices. Uh, okay, so now let me give you uh, very quickly some, some of the conventional statistics. So one conventional statistics that the literature always provide is the so-called uh, area under the rock curve. So the area under the rock curve is essentially plotting uh, whether you are doing a good job at predicting crisis and whether you are, you, are, you, are, you are having a lot of false alarms or not. So what you want to do is have no false alarm and predict all the crisis. If you can do that, you have a no rock, which is near one. Okay, that means you are very good at predicting crisis, but you're not over predicting crisis. And that has been a challenge of the early warning literature is the over prediction of, uh, of crisis. So the closer to one, the better. And you see that here for France, we do super well. So our o rock is 0.98, which is uh, way above anything uh, in the literature. The root mean square error is small and so the interesting thing is that in that particular case, but only for France, actually, if you look at the best fixed convex combination, we even do better with the WA than that, which is possible because asymptotically we should do the same. But uh, in sample, since the WA is time varying and the best fixed combination of expert is fixed, we might do better. And here it, it turns out that we do better and the best fixed combination, convex combination of experts, but it's, uh, it's an idiosyncratic result in, in other. So these are other aggregation rules that we uh, look at in the paper and they don't do as well as the EWA, but nevertheless, some of them do really well also on the, uh, you know, oral criteria or... EWA seems to be more robust in particular for small, um, small samples. Uh, uniform, if we just average, you see we don't do nearly as well, okay? Even though we, we, we do reasonably well, but not nearly as well. So that's, that's for France. Now, I'm just going to go through very quickly because just to show you it works for other countries, this is the UK. So the UK turns out that the model that comes out is the statistical model, which is all kinds of linear and non-linear combinations of long-term interest rate, price to rent, price to rent. okay? So that's... Uh, uh, that's what uh, comes out for the UK. Um, OROC pretty high as well, but not as nice as, uh, as France. Uh, we look at Germany and here it's actually one of the central bank model that uh, does most of the job. But as we go uh, more towards the recent period, there are more false positive here. So again, the statistics are pretty high, but not as, as, as good. Italy, uh, Italy, we uh, we predict also with a bit of a uh, bit early here for the crisis, but we, we do have a pretty strong signal. And uh, the type of models and variables that show up are more on the real side for, for Italy, interestingly, uh, than on the financial side. Um, if we, so, uh, so, so, so that's the type of things that, that we have. But I want to go to the, to the historical data uh, now. So I think what, what this shows, is that model aggregation works. So it's a kind of something that Bates and Granger already have, have pointed out. Um, but I think here it's pretty powerful methodology for model, model aggregation. And the nice thing is that you can really throw in any type of model or, or, or advice that you, that you get. Of course, what is uh, super interesting now is 
whether uh, this type of results that we got on this 1985-2020 sample quarterly data, we could also do the same for super long time series um, historical data, because that's even more maybe intriguing, given that there are lots of structural break potentially and, and, and stuff like that. So we go to historical data now, and we have to switch. Um, we have to switch to uh, annual data because that's what is available. We are going to use the Jorda Shularik Taylor database, macro uh, macro history database. And here we are really in a way testing the Reinhardt and Rogoff model or <laughs> Reinhardt and Rogoff book, uh, which is uh, you know is this time uh, difference eight centuries of financial follies. And they say there are some commonalities in those in those crises. They document, you know, the historical narrative of the crisis. And here, what we are saying is, okay, so if there, there are commonalities, is it the case that uh, if we estimate our models on uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, can we actually predict out of sample uh, the Great Depression? And can we predict whatever happened after that? including up to the 2008 uh, financial crisis uh, and beyond. So it's a very ambitious task is, are we able to predict over centuries, essentially, out of sample financial crisis or not? Okay, so that's what we are trying to do. And we take their entire sample. Uh, we uh, then, uh, so the data starts roughly in 1870, but some variables miss at the beginning. So sometimes I have to start a little bit uh, later. And what we need, again, is we need that at the beginning of the sample, we need systemic crisis. We need crisis. We, we take their crisis datation when we need crisis. So uh, the countries that have crisis at the beginning of the samples are US, France, Japan, Spain, Italy, Netherlands, and Portugal. So we can predict all of those, which is pretty good. Okay. Um, and we are going to try again to predict crisis three years ahead, but this time it's in annual data. So we are trying to predict one, 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 three ones per crisis period, right? And then over Y zero. Which models we are using uh, again, elast log G to the elastic net penalty. We could um, use other things. And we are using uh, again, the GAM, the random forest models. This time we have 12 experts. Uh, is it good? Is it not enough? I don't know. You'll see how we do. Uh, but uh, here are our samples. So the batch sample have different lengths to accommodate a number of crises uh, at the beginning. <laughs> For the US, we have data starting a little bit earlier than the other guys. Uh, so the batch sample starts in 1874. For the other guys, it tends to start in 1880. And then we go up in order to, to have some crisis, uh, essentially two crises at the beginning of a, of a batch sample, because now we have annual data. So two pre-crisis give us six one. Uh, in quarterly data, we had quarters, so we had more ones. <laughs> so, so that's the reason why we, we need those, those two crises at the beginning. And uh, then we go uh, online, that means out of sample forecast uh, from these dates onwards. 1906, 1920. So you see that the Great Depression will be uh, in the out of sample uh, sample. Okay, so now that's really um, challenging because uh, if some of you may know, in terms of a big crisis, a lot happened in the 30s, but then after Bretton Woods, essentially, there was no crisis. No, no big crisis until the 1980s and the 1990s, where we had some idiosyncratic crisis, and then, of course, 2008. So it's going to be super challenging because you need to predict the Great Depression, and then you need to predict zero crisis, and then go back to predicting crisis. So that's a pretty serious uh, challenge. OK, here's what we have for the US, though. So <laughs> that's the US. Uh, starting here, we have 19. Uh, 1905, something like that. And we are out of sample, OK? So we have done the batch sample is be between 1874 and, and then. And uh, the crisis are uh, the purple line and the pre-crisis period that we are trying to predict are the blue line. So you see that, very interestingly, uh, we manage here to predict uh, the Great Depression, OK, out of sample. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I have to say that in the 1930s, we do have quite a few spikes. <laughs> so here we predict things which are 
according to the data, not supposed to be crisis. So there seems to be some turmoil, but uh, these are mistakes from the point of view of the algorithm. Then it's all quietens down. So we have no uh, probability of crisis essentially uh, between 1956 and 1980. And then we have uh, the savings and loans crisis, essentially, which we predict, interestingly. And then it goes back down. And then we have uh, 2000, 2008 that we predict. 2000, actually, here it's 2007. So we predict 2004. So that's, uh, uh, so that's a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty good uh, result. We can, of course, see what are the weights. Uh, and what is interesting is which models predict uh, the crisis. So uh, what we find is that the kind of blue and purple model here tend to predict uh, 1929 and uh, 2007. And uh, the kind of uh, purple one tends to predict uh, the saving and loans. So what are those models? Well, if we look at uh, the, the two models predicting 1929 and 2008, so they have long-term interest rate, GDP per capita, GDP, broad money, and also stock prices, loans, mortgages, and debt to GDP. So this, these combinations are the ones predicting both big systemic crises. And 1984, it's mostly stock prices, loans, mortgages, and debt to GDP. So, uh, so that's what comes out. So Helen, did you look at the let's say some statistical properties of these of these variables? Is it something that's interesting? Let's say, uh, you know, you observe a particular spike in the volatility. There's a above average growth rate or contraction rate. Maybe the correlation to some micro aggregates. Because at the end of the day, what would be very very interesting is, uh, you know, this this offers extreme good insight in what kind of causal model we can think of at the end of the day. And if we see the same two or three typical culprits, we kind of know what we have to go after in terms of theory. Yeah, no, so you're absolutely right. Um, so we haven't done that. Uh, and this is definitely some super nice follow-up. Uh, so the spirit is indeed that if uh, we see a signal being given, uh, we don't know exactly, there's no causal link. So it's just that the information is being given. So it's uh, the next natural step is to say, OK, and we see this signal and there seems to be about uh, this bunch of variables. Let's have a look yeah. at uh, what these variables yeah. do. And if necessary, then from a policy perspective, let's investigate in, in a lot more what details and, and more soft data on what is happening. So that's really the spirit of the exercise. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and the second idea that I had is in the big paper where, where Jordan and Shularik are introducing the data set, new macro facts, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, th there's two things that I think are very relevant or could be relevant. The first one is there are all sorts of qualitative changes over time that can help predict or explain something such as the composition of credit before the before the great depression a lot of credit was going to firms very little mm -hmm. to mortgage afterwards we have the great uh, hockey stick a lot goes to, to to mortgages very little to firm and the second that i remember was very interesting was that they were doing these regressions in the cross section and second and third moments of most almost all the variables had very interesting properties pre and post uh, uh, crisis. So uh, he, they're looking at yeah. the tails, the tails change, the behavior of the tails change, and then, of course, correlation. But in this case, you know, it would be almost limiting because that's only some form of super simple linear relationship. Uh, whereas here, there's so much power to explore sorts of nonlinearities. No, that's great. So I will uh, take a look at, uh, at those uh, additional findings. I don't remember those ones, uh, but that's uh, exactly in the spirit again. So if there's a change in composition, then indeed the mortgages versus uh, you know, uh, loans to non-financial corporation might be an important dimension. And, yeah. and indeed the, the shape of the distribution, we could put them also in some ways, in some models, so in some statistical models and see whether they are picked up. Um, that would be yeah. uh, that would be very yeah. interesting yeah and and of course you know this is a mammoth type of work because for example just the price to rent ratio is mm -hmm. extremely relevant in the real estate literature 
to talk about affordability of sustaining a mortgage. And there's a bunch of models that, that explain why this price to rent ratio, which is equilibrating the rent market and, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the ownership market, plays such an important role there. Uh, and, and again, these would be, you know, but, but it's somehow you have to look at like a hundred potential models. <laughs> uh, yes. and, yeah. yeah, but yeah, maybe machines know, yes. will do that so, for us. Yeah. So the possibilities are a bit endless. Once you start opening the more of a thing and go more granular, you can do lots of interesting things. But you know, precisely, macro pre authorities should be doing a bit of that, I think. So, uh, so, so that's uh, yeah. that's really. And for the theory, as you said, I think it would be very interesting to go a little bit farther uh, down that road. Uh, so I'm just showing you here the usual uh, statistics. So the OROC very high, uh, and uh, here we don't do as well as the best convex combination, uh, but. Um, but we are reasonably close. So that's for the US. Now, how about the other countries, right? So is it like the US a lucky one or not? So here is France. And, uh, and there, we, we don't have um, the kind of equivalent of a saving and loans here, but uh, we have uh, in their database, so we have the 1930s. Then again, we have a lot of turmoil according to our algorithm, but uh, not in the data. So here is not registered as a, as, as a crisis here, but uh, we see that there's quite a bit of turmoil in the 30s, the 40s. Then again, we have completely quiet period. Here we have a little spike. Uh, this is, um, looks like it's the time of a current account crisis a bit in, in France. Uh, and then we have not much, a bit, a bit of little spikes. And, and then we have uh, the big one. And the big one here is a little bit thick, right? So it's not only in 2008, but it, it extends. And, and here we had uh, the so-called residual event, but so here we seem to be picking a, li a little bit of that thickness, uh, the euro area crisis after, after 2008. So, so we do quite well also for France and the type of, uh, the type here of, uh, of variables or models that are picked are, are these ones. Um, so they are a little bit different. Uh, and for 2008, we have uh, here the interest rate, the house price, the real GDP per capita. So unfortunately, uh, the stock price, the house price, the short term rate, we don't have the same variables in the two data sets. So um, that's unfortunate because, uh, yeah, that would be great to have a price to rent, for example, but we don't have it on the time series. So yes, uh, so that's, uh, that's for France. Okay, how about Japan? Japan is super interesting because Japan didn't have a 2008 crisis. It had a crisis before, <laughs> right? It had a crisis in the 1990s, which was uh, seen as a precursor actually of, of 2008 uh, exposed by, uh, by people. And so for Japan, again, we, uh, we see some action in the 1930s, even though the spike is not super high, but, but it's there. Then we see a lot of action in the, the Second World War, but that's not a crisis according to our, to our data, then nothing. And then we do pick up the banking crisis of, um, of the end of the 1990s in Japan. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. And then things quite down and, and indeed we don't have the spike in 2008. So that's a very nice one because cross-sectionally it's very different, right? From the other countries, it's very different. Uh, okay, uh, now this is the type of things that come up for, for Japan. So we have narrow money, broad money, interest rates. Uh, we have, um, uh, and, and interestingly, we have, uh, so here we have also house price, et cetera, interest rates of price. We have population uh, for Japan, real GDP per capita. Anyway, so we are missing also the price to rent and, and all that stuff. Okay, so the OROC are, are very good. I mean, they are not as good as the US, but they are, they are very good. Spain, Spain is also an interesting one because Spain has a, has a big crisis in the, just before the eighties, it's idiosyncratic. Uh, and okay, it has the, the same issue with the uh, 1930s, 1940s. We're predicting some crises which do not seem to be in the data when we quite end down. Then we predict the, this crisis before the, um, the 1980s. And then it's a bit thin, but we do have some action here in, the, in 2008, and then a little bit uh, the time of a euro area crisis. So that's what we find uh, for Spain. And that one uh, was, link, was, was linked to the oil price. That was a kind of balanced payment style crisis for Spain uh, in the, 
and, and so interestingly, the models that predict it, you do find the exports, exchange rate, investment to GDP ratio. Okay, so kind of real side things. Uh, that's what seems to be picked uh, for Spain. Okay, Italy. Italy is an interesting one as well. <laughs> we have the usual uh, spikes uh, in the 30s, 40s. We have quite period relatively. And then we have uh, the usual uh, big uh, systemic crisis here. Plus in Italy in the 80s, we have one. Uh, it was mostly uh, Southern Italy uh, style crisis, uh, some banking crisis in Southern Italy. Uh, so we pick that one as well, which is at a different timing than, uh, than all the rest so far. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Okay, so we have that. And I'm just going to give you the, the graph so that you can see that's the Netherlands. So the Netherlands is, uh, is also uh, quite a special case because the crisis is a little bit later in the 1930s, it's after 1935. Uh, then we have a quiet zone and then we have uh, 2008, 2007, 2008. All right, and then we have Portugal and Portugal similarly, so we do quite well, we have a few bumps it would be nice to know Portuguese history to see whether this makes any sense. Uh, but then we have the, uh, the big 2008 crisis. Okay, so uh, I think to conclude, um, what seems to be uh, to be true, uh, based on these two papers, is that uh, this methodology has some potential and uh, we have scratch the surface here because we can do quite well in terms of out of sample forecast certainly compared to to the literature but in absolute terms as well i mean we we, we are able to do out of sample forecast of uh, of financial crisis uh, this seems to pick very different models uh, for different countries with different combinations so it's also not a simple story of a simple crisis a credit to gdp ratio that is going to forecast everything it's not that Okay, it's something else. It's not even only credit to GDP plus valuations. It's not only that, it's something else. Um, and uh, the only thing, of course, I mean, uh, the lim there are limitations to this, <laughs> to this methodology. A, there's no causal implication, of course. And B, uh, it is very unlikely that this uh, methodology could predict any uh, type of crisis that has not happened yet. So that is not a type of this endogenous systemic risk buildup. So if we have a cyber, risk uh, crisis, which can be a systemic crisis. I, I mean, I don't see why we would predict such a thing. We, uh, there's no reason we would predict it. So it's only, there is some information in the previous kind of macroeconomic systemic risk style crisis um, that allows us to, to get enough information to predict them, but certainly that doesn't apply across the board. So uh, kind of exogenous thing or, you know, tougher pandemic stuff, uh, we, we won't, we won't predict it. That's not, yeah, there's no information about that. So thanks a lot. And thank you very much for, I see that in the chat also, that's great. There's some documentation on the Elastic Net with uh, lasso ridge penalties and, uh, and the rock. <laughs> yes, it's information uh, theory style thing. <laughs> so that's, that's good. Uh, that's exactly, uh, that helps. Thank you very much. <laughs> Many thanks. Um, are there any questions from the attendees? Um, please raise, raise your hand and... Okay, so while our colleagues are, uh, are waiting... Okay, Colin, go ahead. Just one question, um, Len, would it be a meaningful exercise to try to, to train a suite of models over all of the countries or, or do you really need, or are the models country specific um, because they're relying on country specific data? Yeah, I think, I mean, you could try it, but I really think that uh, you need to, to have good results. You need country specific. Uh, so you can estimate panel models but uh, but when you make them learn about crisis, I think you should make them learn about their countries, the, the country you're trying to predict. Because uh, why be interesting to see the result. I mean, yeah. Why, why yeah. would you? I, I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why would you make them learn on a, you know, on a, I don't know, a, a Japanese crisis? 
but I guess that was the whole point of the this time it's different. I mean, the, the Reinhard Rogoff argument is that it's not. It's it's the same triggers every time. And I, I so I guess if yeah. you if you if you have a common suite, it's not then the same maybe you triggers can... every time. It's that there are some commonalities somewhere, but it's okay. it, it, there's no and and you see it that uh, in our in our results that the type of models and variables that are picked are very different uh, across countries. So you can. You can imagine that if you constrain this thing to be the same, you are gonna not gonna do very well. Does this mean we need a macroeconomics per country, though? So we we stop teaching macro. We teach French macro. We teach Japanese macro. We no, no, no. That doesn't mean that uh, at all. I mean, uh, and uh, you know, you you can use uh, again. You can estimate your your model on the batch sample if you like using panel data. Uh, and you do have global variables, uh, actually, in the mix. You have global you know, capital flows. You, you know that stock markets are super highly correlated across countries, et cetera. So there is definitely a kind of international interlinkages, global kind of dimension. However, the way it plays out then in terms of each country, it, it's so many things interacting together that uh, have to do with the possibly the institutional setup of the country, uh, the type of financial markets of a country, but mm. uh, these are things that precisely we are not able really to to deal with if we use very simple models, um, and that's why we don't do as well if we use a, kind of a uniform uh, simple model. But this methodology allows you to be more um, tailored, and, and I think that's a plus. Mm. Thank you. Mm. So. Uh, Helen, I actually have the, like a couple of uh, uh, thoughts and like one comment, uh, which is a little bit related to this. Oh, Kent has has a question. Um, I'll just keep mine and I'll ask you afterwards. Go ahead, Kent. So Kent, are you able to, to uh, um, unmute yourself? He's muted, I think. Yeah, I just asked him to unmute. Which doesn't seem to be working. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. I got a strange message that said I should unmute and then when I unmuted it muted. Sorry about that. Right. Helen, here's the one thing I loved your presentation and I love doing Here's one thing you might consider that, that would cost very little and might improve your model. At it, it, worst, it'll have no effect. If you put a tiny little forgetting parameter in your models on your weighting, it will give you some flexibility. Uh, when it, a very common thing in these Bayesian thing of experts is that one expert dominates and the others get so unimportant, it's hard for them and in a prior sense to build up their credibility again. And you might think that even though you, even, and you can argue that even from your standpoint, you're arguing, well, countries might be very different from each other. So why use the same weights on one country as another? Well, you could argue that countries themselves might evolve over time. So perhaps some models that did very well in the past might cease to be. And what I find, I can send you a paper about it, but what I find empirically is if you put very, very low decay rates, I'm talking about one in 10,000 or something like that for every year, you don't actually lose that you, you, it gives you a little more robustness. It won't wreck you. The, the, the base, it's like a switching back. It's some probability one in 10,000 that a uniform model suits best. Okay. It, it really won't bring up your bad models very much, but it mm -hmm. might give you a little more flexibility. I, I don't mean this as a criticism, just something helpful that you might want to consider. No, absolutely. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And actually, it, uh, this is something that is used in this literature. So uh, I think it's called the fixed share aggregation rule or something like that. Uh, we experimented a tiny bit with it. And indeed, it's, um, uh, it, it doesn't noticeably change the forecasting power, but it might in other applications, at least when, when we did in our... So, so that's actually a good thing. I think indeed it's... Uh, it's a, it's a good uh, it's good for robustness uh, to look at what it gives, and there, there might be some cases in which actually it would be important to have that maybe for longer samples or something like that. So uh, so I think it's um, it's a very very good suggestion, and it is something that the online learning has uh, 
as, exper as experimented with, and there are some asymptotic results on, on this type of aggregation rule as well. So, uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, it's absolutely right. <laughs>